So it was, uh, <laughs> Lexi, hi, that's all right, she's cute. It was, about, it was uh, February 6th, I guess, it was about 11 weeks ago that uh, I stood before you and, and I told you about a new series that we were going to start called The Healthy Body, and I, I was believing, and I shared this with you, that, I, that, that God uh, had put this message series on, uh, on my heart and on your table because I believed that what He wanted for our church this year was for us to be a healthy church because I believed that He wanted to, to use Revolution Church to do something mighty for Him. And so I felt like uh, he, he really wanted us to be healthy. And so we started to, to uh, study the, the Scriptures to see how we could avoid um, our own personal drift and starting out strong but ending up weak or ending up in the ditch personally. And then, of course, as a church, as a whole, we studied the Scriptures and see the churches in the Bible that had started out well and then got sideways and drifted as well. And we wanted to see how we could avoid that uh, or if maybe we'd been there already and we could just get back on track. And so uh, we started studying uh, those churches that were in the Scriptures. And I still believe uh, after now 11 weeks that the same uh, thing applies. I think that God does want to do something incredible with your church. And I think that it's evident by what God has been doing here over the last couple of months, uh, putting us in position uh, to, uh, in, in this move to impact more lives in a greater way. And so uh, I see that he was preparing us to do such a thing. And for, in order for us to, to, uh, to accomplish his task, we do need to be a healthy church. And so what I'd like to do tonight as we uh, land the plane in this series before we kick off a series in the book of Ephesians, which should be uh, awesome. I'm looking forward to it immensely. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight uh, is, is I'd like to drill down a little bit deeper into some of the things that we had already discussed the last, it was 10 weeks really, because uh, one week in there, uh, Deshaun White came and preached, if you remember. He was a great young man. I'm trying to try to uh, convince him to come down to Florida and hang out with us a little bit more, but he's, him and his fiance are praying and seeing uh, what the Lord would want them to do, and so uh, if you want to, keep them in your prayers, but I want to drill down deeper into uh, some of the topics we've already covered, and I want to take pause because I don't want to, to uh, what we do is, is, is we, we preach a, 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 a certain topic on a Saturday night, and, and you get through it, and then automatically, I think our minds, I don't know if it's, if it's just me, maybe it's just me, but my mind already begins to think about next week and what we're going to learn next week and what we're going to do next week. And so as quickly as we gain the information, we lose it. And, and I don't want that to happen because I think if we're going to be a healthy church, we have to grab a hold of some of these principles that we learned over the last 10 weeks. We, we have to let this sink down into our hearts, into our soul, so that we can be a certain type of person moving forward. And so we really need to, to go back. And what I've decided to do, and I hope and pray that it was the Lord's guidance, and that is to, to cover some of the main things that we've talked about and, and drill them down deeper into your heart so they become who you are and who we are as a people. So we've been studying this, uh, this series called The Healthy Body. We've been studying the body of Christ. And, and, and the, the Bible uh, calls this uh, you guys, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> can you hold her? It's very hard for me to walk and, and not step on her and stuff. So that would be awesome. Um, and it's, I can't concentrate. So um, the, the, the Bible uh, considers us, uh, they call, it calls us lots of different things. Uh, most, most often it's referred, we're referred to as the body of Christ. Ephesians 1.23 says, and, and, the, and the church is Christ's body. It is made full and complete by Christ. Okay? It, it's, it's, it's referred to most oftenly as his body. Okay? But it's not the only thing that it's referred to. Uh, in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, and I hope you have a Bible in front of you. Who doesn't have a Bible? You need a Bible? You need a Bible? Get a Bible. They're blue. They're free. Take one. And if you need it, steal it. It's okay. Okay? So, so, and most of the verses that I'm going to talk about are in the, the some of them are going to be on the screen, and you can get the, the reference, and you can, you can read it, okay? So, so uh, 
In Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, it says not only we're the body, but it says we are God's holy people. Uh, We are members of God's family. We are his house. We are a holy temple where God lives by his spirit. Uh, The Bible will also refer to us as as Christ's bride. So we're referred to in a lot of different ways, but referring back to this whole idea of, of the holy temple and his house, I want you to picture something for a moment. Do me a favor. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. I close your eyes. I want you to picture something as I'm talking. Okay, the scriptures say that the church is built upon the foundation. See a foundation? Do you see it? Your eyes are open. You can't see it if you're looking at me. It's built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That means that this word, this Bible you have in your hand, God's Holy Spirit inspired men to pen his words. And, and so the, the entire church, everything that it does, the way it functions, the way it was built, it's based on these truths that are in your Bible. Everything that they say right here, the church is built on this. That is the foundation of the church. And of course it goes on to say that not only is, the, is the, the church built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, but the cornerstone itself, the, the one rock, the one piece of the foundation that carries all the weight that everything relies on is Jesus Christ himself. Do you see it? Everything, all the weight, everything that the church is, its life it's, it's future, it's inception, it's creation, it's sustaining. Everything relies upon Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And then it's us. See, see, there's the foundation. You still get your eyes closed? There's the foundation. It's God's word. There's the corner. There's the con- oh, I'm from Boston. Wow, that snuck out. There's the cornerstone. That's Jesus. And then above it, is this temple, right? There's this building where he dwells by his spirit. That's us. The holy of holies inside the believer. And that's where God dwells. Do you see it? Do you see it? That's the church. The church, us, we, we are the visible image of the invisible Christ. And it goes on, it says that it's being made full and complete by Christ. You know, you know what that means? You can open your eyes now. You know what that means? You know, I, 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 uh, I've been doing this now for, for quite a long time, and I've seen people leave the church because, you know, they didn't like it. So they got hurt somehow. You know, it wasn't like a doctrinal thing. It wasn't theology. It wasn't some blatant, grievous sin like crazy. They just, you know, I didn't like that. And they leave. Guess what? Every church is a work in progress. No church is perfect. See, that's the thing. People have this standard that the, that the church has to live up to their perfect standards all the time. Listen, it says right here that the, that the church is being made full and complete. You know what that means? It's a work in progress. That means that no church has arrived yet. No church is all that it could be right now. It's being made complete and full right now. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. It's a process, and the church is being built. As we speak right now, as these words are coming out of my mouth, do you ever wonder what Jesus Christ is doing? I don't know what you're doing all the time, but you know what Jesus is doing? He's building his church. That's what he's doing right now. He's building his church. And it's being made full and complete right now. The scriptures say that the one who began a good work will continue to do so until he returns to gather us up, to take us with him, into glory. And we know that he's working on our church as, and it's been evidenced by the fact that he laid this series on our heart to teach us by his word how to be a healthy, growing church that's filled with love. That's the way he builds his church. His eyes are upon revolution. His favor is obvious and his provision is quite evident. It's quite evident. He's working on us. That's what Jesus Christ is doing right now. He's working on his church. He's building his church. He's praying for his people. He's putting us together. He's completing it. He's filling up the church right now as we speak. 
He's working on all of us right now to build his church. And so I ask you, like I did last week, anyone with ears to hear should listen to the Spirit. He wants to build his church. And you should understand what the Spirit is trying to say to the church. And I pray that you have ears. I pray that you'll hear. So let's kind of bullet point some things. First thing I want to say is we talked about the, the individual first before we talked about the church. So the first thing is that the body of Christ is comprised of parts. Romans 12.5 says, So it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Now, who understands the, the concept of being the church being filled with a bunch of different parts? Raise your hand. That makes sense, right? We're all here. You're each a part. Parts is parts is parts, right? But the part that really grabbed me was this part at the end where it says, and we all belong to each other. See, most of us in, us in our world, and myself included most of my life, I was very, very focused on me. I need to take care of me. When I go to work during the day, it's to take care of my needs and my responsibilities and my stuff. And so some of us get away from that, and, and praise God, we, 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 we're not totally selfish. We, we maybe um, we, we have a wife or a, or a husband and maybe a, a child or two, and we expand our, our coverage, if you will, our, our desire to, to care for someone or love for someone uh, beyond ourselves, maybe to a, a, an immediate family. But what this tells us here is that the body of Christ is even bigger than that. What this is telling you is that it's not just limited to just yourself or maybe just your, your little family, but you're part of something that is way bigger than yourself. Did, did you know that, that, that you, uh, the, the Giacomos have a big family? It's, there's 10, say, right? Oh, 10 kids. And one of them's Michael. Big. That's, that's a lot. That's a big family, right? Listen, the Bible says that, there, that the body of Christ is made up of all these parts and we all belong to each other. That's a big family, but, but if you've embraced Christ by faith, you're part of a family that is two and a half billion strong. It, it, it eclipses the, 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 the generations and it, it expands to all the different continents all over the world, and that's just right now. That's what you're part of. It's incredible what you're part of. It's bigger than yourself, but... Listen, for the body of Christ to be healthy, the individual parts must be healthy. Would you agree? You, you, if, 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 every, if every part of your body was diseased, could you say that your body was healthy? No. And so we must, be, we must maintain personal health because if we're part of something that is big, if we're part of this body of Christ that spans the generations and the continents, billions strong, you have to be healthy. So, so here's the challenge. Like, okay, I get it, but how do I achieve health? Can I give you some Bible verses to chew on? Okay, let's fill up. Colossians 2.6. Just as you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, so you must continue. How did you come to Christ? Did you ever think about that? How did you, how, just as you accepted, just as it happened, how, what happened when you came to Christ? You, you realized that you, you came to him humbly like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this on my own. I need your help. My ways don't work. You're right. I'm wrong. I need you. Right? Isn't that which way you came? You, you, you just wasn't working out. I need you. I need your help. And, and, and he says, listen, just like you did that, you came to me. Do you know that he, he has, you have nothing that he needs? Did you know that? But he has everything that you need. And so you have to, listen, he doesn't need to come up to you and say, Ben, can you please play guitar for me this week? Because if you don't, my church is going to close. Like, he never does that. And we appreciate that he comes and plays. But see, do you, see, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, God doesn't need him to play. But Ben needs everything that God has. Right? And so, so, so we came to him, and then the personal health thing here is we, we have to continue, just like it says, just as you did it, continue to do it. Keep coming to him with that same attitude and that same posture all the time. Romans 12, 11, I love this. Never be lazy, but let the Spirit excite you as you serve the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, are you serving the Lord? Ask him. Are you serving the Lord? Come on now. Listen, you ready for the next one? Look at your neighbor and tell him, don't be lazy. 
Quit being lazy. Listen to this verse, man. Ne- listen. These aren't suggestions, right? <laughs> Ne- Listen, never be lazy, but let the Lord excite you as you serve the Lord. You see, you see there's, a, there's an anchor to that verse. Do you know what the anchor is? It's the thing that has to be done for this to work. For him to excite you about the things of God more, you have to be serving him. You have to be serving him. So that's the thing. Are you serving the Lord? Are you serving the Lord? So I'm going to be honest with you. The last two weeks, we, this church has put up on our, who has Facebook? Come on, just raise your hand. Be honest in church, okay? I, we have put up for the last two weeks an opportunity for you to serve. We need some friendly first faces at that door so people, when they walk up, they feel loved and welcomed. Put it up probably 10 times. Not one. There's an opportunity to serve. And if you're not excited about the things of God, if you're not excited about the mission of God, if you're not excited about the word of God, Maybe it's because you're not serving God. And so consider serving the Lord. Because his promises is if you serve him, he will excite you. His spirit will stir inside of you. And all of a sudden, it's like a snowball effect. The more you serve, the more you're going to want to. The more you read, the more you're going to want to. The more you pray, the more you're going to want to. The higher your hands, the higher you want them to go again. That's just the way he works. Here's another one. You want another one? All right. Jot this down. Hebrews 11.6. God is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Joshua 1, 7 and 8, don't don't deviate from God's instructions and meditate on them day and night, and only then will you succeed and prosper in everything you do. Don't, don't, you need to, you can't deviate from them, and you must meditate on them day and night, nonstop. Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, For they, those people, the ones who are hungering and thirsting, they'll be satisfied. God will satisfy that hunger. He will quench that thirst. If you come after him thirsty as the deer pants for for streams of water, he's thirsty, he's thirsty. He's looking through the forest all day. Where's the stream? Where's the stream? I'm thirsty. I need something to drink. Like a dog. (laughs) Where's my drink? Where's my drink? Where's my bowl of water? He's, He's searching after it. That's what the deer does all day. Bad mic. Is that you? Are you panting for God? Are you thirsting for God? If you are, he'll satisfy that. Jeremiah 29, 13, if you search for me, if you seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. Earnest, relentless, constant, and consistent pursuit of Almighty God and His purposes. Now, why, why, such, why, why is such zeal uh, 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 desired? Why, why does God want you to have such zeal for Him? Well, remember last week I, I told you that He said, if you love me, you keep my commands. Right? So, so let's just start with just raw, ground-level obedience. He, he says, come after me like crazy, right? That's what he says. Come after me with your whole heart. Come after me with your whole heart. So, so listen, if, if obedience was it, look at your neighbor and say, that's sufficient. Right? That's sufficient. He said so. That's good enough reason for me. Right? But there's benefit to it. There's benefit to it. See, he, he wants you to come after him with, with crazy zeal, not just because of obedience, but because God knows we need it, or else what happens? We drift. We drift. We have to come after him with our whole heart like crazy, or else we drift. Do me a favor, open up that Bible to Galatians chapter 5. Bless your preacher, and let me hear some pages turning. Oh, I like that. Can't do it on a phone, huh? Yeah. Just don't let it be that Android <coughs> when you press the. I hate that noise, man. It sounds like an old '80s club. <coughs> Golly, get an apple, would you please? Galatians chapter five, verse sixteen through nineteen. You ready? So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. What was the claim? You need it as you drift, right? Isn't that what I said? 
So let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. There's a battle going on right now. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. Now listen, let's pause there for a second. It doesn't say that you can't make good choices. You can't carry out your good intentions. It's just not easy. It means that there's a battle right now between your two ears to control who you are and what you're going to do. Because it says here that the, 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 the claim was that if you don't come after him like crazy, you're going to drift, right? And it says right here that your sinful nature is craving, like craving something. Do you ever crave something? You're not just hungry. No, you crave something. Just talk to a pregnant lady, right? Just talk to a pregnant lady when she's craving something crazy. But, but don't get in her way. Right? And, and so he says that, that the, the sinful nature is craving some. You know what he's craving to do? You know what you're craving to do? It says it right there. Evil. That, 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 look, that's what it says. So the reason why God says to come after him like crazy is because your sinful nature, your bent is to do evil. It craves evil. And we need to come after him full time or else we, we're going to drift. And you know what? Another reason why we, he wants us to do it? It's life experience. Seriously, right now. I mean, let, I talked about this like 10 weeks ago, but let's be honest. Uh, when, when, when you, uh, just raise your hand when you, when you feel like you're agreeing with me, right? When, when you stop reading so much, your Bible, and you stop attending churches often, and you stop serving, and you stop giving, and, you're, and your prayer life falls off the table, who starts cussing a little bit more, and their temper gets a little bit shorter, and their, wee, their wick just evaporates? Come on now. So I love it when life just proves God's word to be right again. Praise him. Praise him. Awesome, right? We need this thing. So, so if you know it, go after it. Personal health requires personal pursuit, and that's why the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 9.27, he says, uh, Paul, Paul says this, I, I discipline my body like an athlete, or, or in some translations, I, I strike a blow to my body making it a slave because he knows he doesn't want to get up and and read the Bible every day. He knows that he doesn't want to go to church all the time. He knows he doesn't want to pray, right? He's a human like us, and we're like that, right? So so he says, I make myself do it. You know, I was thinking about this this week, the, 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 the Olympic figure skater or the, 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 the Olympic boxer who, who at a young age finds that they have a talent to box or, or figure skate or whatever, and, and every single morning, you know, four or five o'clock in the morning, they're getting up out of bed when the rest of us lazy people are just drooling on our pillow and snuggling with our wives and husbands or whatever, and we're lazy and we don't want to get up, and it feels so good. Doesn't that bed feel just so good in the morning? Who wants to get up at 4.30 in the morning to go run? You have to be insane to want to do that. But year after year, right, do you think that there's mornings that the Olympic boxer doesn't want to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and go run 10 miles with someone screaming at them? But listen, one day, one day, they're going to step on a platform and the judge that's no mistake, is going to put a gold medal around his neck. And it's worth it all. But, but to get there, right? Listen, yo. To get there, you've got you to tr- discipline yourself like an athlete to get up and do what you don't want to do. I don't want to go to church tonight. I'm going anyway. I don't want to give anymore because I'm broke and I need the money. Give anyway. I don't feel like praying. I'm not in the mood. Pray anyway. I don't want to be nice to them. Be nice to them anyway. I don't want to serve at the church. I'm busy. Serve anyway. Do it anyway. Train yourself. Discipline your body like an athlete. Strike a blow to it. Here's the second thing. Not only is it the body of Christ uh, made up of parts, but the second thing is that the parts are brought together as one body. This is probably the most, uh, wide, uh, most commonly used verse over the last uh, 10 weeks. It's Ephesians 4.16. God makes the whole body fit together perfectly. I guess that means we're a perfect church, huh? after all. Huh? <laughs> kind of, sort of. 
Maybe the raw materials are real good, but we're a work in progress. But, but notice that we're no long, it's no longer just personal anymore now. See, 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 he works in you and he develops you and then he puts you into the body. So it's no longer just a personal thing. And it says now, as each person, remember the context, as they're going after the Lord, they're pursuing him with their whole heart. As the dare pants for streams of water, so my soul longs for you. And you come to Christ and he pours his spirit out into you and he gives you some gifts and then he places you into a body just like here. And as each of us does their own work, it helps the others to grow. You see, again, it's bigger than just yourself. You're part of something. You're part of something. It helps the others to grow, so what's the end result of the whole body here? The whole body is healthy, growing, and full of love. We've moved from golf to baseball, from from tennis to, to football. We're no longer a solo sport. We're part of a team, and we have to consider that is greater than ourselves, but there's more drift there to avoid as a team. And we first visited the churches in Galatia where the first warning was, hey, don't get, all, don't get all religious. So you came to Christ. That's awesome. That's great. Praise the Lord. But don't get religious on me. And so we did. We visited Galatians, the Galatian church, the Galatian churches. And so go look at uh, chapter 3. Go back one page and look at chapter 3 and look at, the, look at the drift here that he indicates. Right there at the beginning of the chapter. Are you there? Okay, so he says, oh, foolish Galatians. So let's just, just, just say, oh, you foolish revolutionaries, right? I mean, he could be talking, he, we're trying to avoid the drift, right? So let's just try to avoid this drift. Man, I really need a new microphone. Wow. They're only like $1,500, that's all. Golly. Because there's a lot of rich people around here, eh? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, foolish revolutionaries. Woohoo! Revolt. Listen. Who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. You know, they don't have smartphones back then, right? They couldn't just Google a picture. They couldn't Google into, like, Google Earth and go to, 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 to Calvary and see all this going down. Like we can now, right? We can, we can go across the earth and we can visit the, the Leaning Tower and the Eiffel Tower and the Grand Canyon and the Great Wall of China. And, the, and I, went to, I went to Egypt once. That was cool. I went to see the pyramids and stuff. That was cool. It didn't cost me nothing. But they didn't have that back then. But he's like, listen, I came to you. This is what he's saying. I came to you and I explained the gospel to you. I explained who he was. I explained who you were. I I made it clear to you that you needed him for salvation and that the only way you could save yourself is through him, not through anything you could do. And you had these laws that God gave you, but they will never suffice to make you right with God. He was very clear with these people. And so he says, listen, it was just as though you were there, in other words. You had a clear picture of exactly what, not just what went down that day, but the meaning of it. I explained it all to you. So let me ask you this one question, which is the total, you know, no pastor says one question. It's always, so he says three. He says, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. See, when you heard and you believed, you received. Someone say amen. How foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, like you did it right, when you, when you got saved, you did it right. So why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? So this is the difference between religion and faith. So he mentions it right here. He says, your own human effort. See, religion is, 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 is human effort and rules and regulations and steps to try to get close to God. And faith is just relying on what God did to get close to you. And that's what Christianity is. It's a faith. It's not a religion. Salvation is by grace. Sanctification, the process of becoming less of me and more of him, is also by grace. All progress and godliness is the work of God in you, not of yourselves. The Bible says to to let God transform you into a new person Not by you doing something different. By letting him change the way you think. See, our personal responsibility is this. 
Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. So when you see other people that are not Christians, don't do like they do. And then let. And then your personal responsibility dies. Don't copy the rest of the world, but let God. That's it. My responsibility is don't do what everyone else is doing, but let God. That means open up the deepest caverns of my heart and my mind and say, God, have at it. Let your spirit bury down deep into me. Let your words grow down deep in me. And you search out my heart and my mind and you fix what's wrong and you make me into you. That, have at me. That's, your, that's what you do. And then it's up to him to change you. All change in godliness is the work of God. The one who began a good work in you will continue to do so. So we must do this. We must be a church that is absolutely immersed and swimming in the grace of God in all things. In all things. Now, when we got done with uh, the churches in Galatia, we visited southern Greece, uh, the church in Corinth, and my oh my. So there's lots of things there, but I'm not going to talk about them all. But let me just tell you this. The first thing that he talked about here, this massive, massive, huge problem, and it still lives today, and it needs to stop. 1 Corinthians 1.10, let there, someone could probably finish the verse for me. Let there be no divisions in the church. No, listen. Look at your neighbor and say, no divisions. No divisions. No divisions in the church. He goes on, he says, has, has, has Jesus been divided into factions? How many Jesuses are there? Is, does that make him a Jesus? I don't even know. How many, how many Jesuses are, has Jesus somehow been divided into like, there's this Jesus over here, and then there's a part of him over there, and then there's a part, and the scriptures are clear. Jesus has not been divided into different factions, as a matter of fact. Jesus Christ himself in John 17, he's praying, and he says to his Father in heaven, he says, he says Daddy, let them be one as you and I are one. Now listen, I have to be, admit to you my, my inability to even comprehend what that oneness looks like. Do, do you understand? Like the Bible says that when you get married, the two become one flesh. Who's married here? Okay. Good, love my wife, right? <laughs> Why are you not raising your hand? Okay. <laughs> so, so the Bible says that when you're married, right? Listen up, listen up. That the two become one flesh. So, so listen, I have to, I, I admit, I, I love Meredith. She, she's rocking. I love her. And, 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 and generally speaking, we get along pretty well. And, and, but, but this is going to come as a surprise. We, we sometimes disagree on some things. I didn't anticipate a response from you. But, you know, she, she, was, she was born and in, in, raised in Maryland. And I was born and raised outside of Boston. So we're a little bit different. And she had a, I, I'm from a Jewish family. She was, you know, Mimi, okay? Queen Jesus over here. She's like loving Jesus forever. That's just the way she is. She's been loving Jesus since the day she was born. And so Meredith's the same way. Well, I wasn't like that. And she has, and you all know her, she has different ways of, of taking care of these kids. And she's like the Gestapo up in this joint, right? And I'm let, if it was up to me, they'd be running across these chairs like a bunch of crazy animals. That's just the way, and as a matter of fact, when this church started, that's, it, that's exactly what they did. And I got a talking to. But, but we're different, right? But, but it says that the two become one flesh. So, it, it, like, I love my wife, and, and, we, and we're, we're, I think we're a really good team. I really do. I think we're a really good team. And, and most of the time, we get along well, and, and when we don't, we, we tend to work stuff out, but there's still differences. She likes this, and I, I like that. She doesn't like peanut butter and jelly, I, right? Heathen. Heathen. What? She can't, yeah, you're not allowed to say fart. Scratch that from the record. But, but we're different, right? But, but on, in this, on this earth, in this lifetime, th that's the, the most one you're going to get, husband and wife. But, but this surpasses that. See, I, I can't even, I can't comprehend the oneness 
that Jesus Christ and his Father have. You know, Jesus said that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That I and the Father are one. Like, inseparable. You couldn't tell them apart if they were standing right here. Like, they're the same, yet different. So I don't understand. I can't put words to the oneness of the Father and the Son, but yet he prays to the Father that we would be just like, that we would be one with each other just as he and the Father are one. So I just have to ask you, do you think that the Father and the Son are, are squabbling over doctrine? Do you think that they're fighting and, and, and arguing over style or, or, or the, you know, what these churches down here look like or what kind of music they play or how big or small or wide the buildings are or if the lights are up or the lights are down or the, when the service times are, if it's this kind of music, that kind of music, or is it too loud, too short? Or is he just going, just worship me? Th- let me ask you this. Are they squabbling, are the father and son squabbling about Anything, ever, someone other than Andy, never, and that, listen, loved ones, that's what he called us to, that's the goal, to let there be no divisions in the church, that we would be that one. And, and I'm telling you that denominations that drive churches apart are the same as cliques within, you know, cliques are denominations in the same building, and denominations and cliques are from hell, and that's where they need to go. They don't, there's no room for them in the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Colossians that in this new life, we are all one. Jesus said in John 10, 16, that there should be one flock with one shepherd. One. That's it, one church. But in this world that we live in, we're separated by color and, and ethnicity and socioeconomic status and geography, where you live, where you come from, your heritage and your age and your sex and all these ways that society divides us, those are from hell too. But Jesus Christ came and his work on the cross was to put one family together with one shepherd. And that's what he's called us to, up with diversity and down with division. Okay, here's the, here's the second thing in Corinth. This is, a, this is where it starts to get real rough. You know, the, if that one wasn't hard enough, you have to go easier on non-believers. You have to go easier on non-believers. Wasn't it joyous that there was a day that he opened up your eyes to him? All of us were dead in our sins at some point in our life. And one day, one amazing day, I don't know when it was, Maybe you have a born on date like a Coors Light. I don't have it. I don't remember what it is. But maybe you do. And, 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 but one day he opened up your eyes to the reality of, of, of who he was and your need for him and your complete inadequacy to get healed on your own. And, and so he opens up our eyes, praise God, but then, then all of a sudden we start stoning others for acting out, you know? It happens all the time. 1 Corinthians 2 uh, 12 through 16, I'm not going to read it, but you can jot that reference down and read it later. But it says here that, that, that only the Spirit of God can understand what God's saying. The, only the Spirit can understand the things of God. And that if, you are, if you're a believer, He has given you, in these verses it says He has given you His Spirit. And He's also given you the, the mind of Christ. So, so those people that do not have those things All of God's truths are foolishness to them and they don't understand it. But yet we Facebook rip them. And Scripture tells us clearly that it's the sweetness of God that leads to repentance. Not the public verbal raping of one who doesn't know any better. And that's what we do. We're called to love these people outside of the church, not to judge them. Do you understand that God's already placed judgment on all of the human race? That outside of the saving grace of, of Jesus Christ, he's already placed judgment on them. He doesn't need your help to do it anymore. He's already done it. So what we need to do is show them the sweetness of God that leads them to repent and want to come to Jesus. Show them something that they would want. Here's another Corinthian drift. It goes right in line with going easier on the unbeliever, and that is to go harder on the believer. 
You see, God placed you all in a church together, and it's not just to come together and sing kumbaya. There's a reason why we're together. 1 Corinthians 5.12, Paul says, certainly it's not my responsibility to judge those outside of the church. God's already done that. Just said that. But it is certainly, it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside of the church that are sinning. And so if you see a brother and sister in Christ that's caught up in sin, you get them alone in a room with the Word of God and you gently remind them of what God's judgments say about the sin they're involved in. That's what we're supposed to do. But people say, only God can judge me. Er, Wrong. 1 Corinthians 5.12. So we get them in a room with God's Word and you remind them of what they're supposed to be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, what they should be doing. Here's another common drift in the church. It's found in 1 Corinthians uh, 4.6. And that is that the word of God in churches stops being preached. We need to get back to what is written. We need to get back to what is written in God's word. And you know, when Jesus was tempted by the devil himself, what did he say? Did he come up with some like psycho babble, this is a good idea theory? What did he say? It is written. When listen, when the devil himself, like I'm sure he doesn't have red horns and and a pitchfork. But for your own imagination, the devil with the little horns and the pitchfork comes right up to Jesus Christ and tempts him. Like how many times has that happened to you that the devil himself, like incarnate, like manifest, physical, right in your face, the devil, not one of his little demon boys, I'm talking about the, 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 the head water buffalo. The, 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 the king of all evil. That was a Flintstones reference for us old people. Did you get it? The, yeah, the head water buffalo. So, so the, the, the real devil, not one of his homies, but the real guy comes right up into the face of Jesus. And what does Jesus, what does Jesus say? He's the word of God himself, right? He could have said anything and it would have made it to the book, but he didn't. He quoted what was in the book already. He quoted the word of God. we got to get back to what is written. And certainly there's, pla- there's a place in the Bible, I mean, there's a place in the church for, for getting together with brothers and sisters in Christ and kind of roundtabling it and reasoning together and having a, an open dialogue. But listen, when you come to church for the gathering, when the preacher stands up, it's not a place for discussions and, and sharing some thoughts and telling some stories and keep it short, you know, tickle their ears, make them feel good. No, 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 no. No, the Bible says that Jesus Christ gifted the church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, preachers, and teachers. And that word preacher, that's a gift from Jesus. It's the Greek word keruso. He's a heralder. He is to be a public crier of divine truth. That's who the preacher's supposed to be. With shouts of proclamation, proclaiming the word of God. That's what the preacher's supposed to do. And that's why Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all of Scripture, every single word of this book, is God-breathed. These are God's words. And the preacher is to stand up and proclaim the truth of God's word. Not to be shy, but to be bold. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful to teach us what is truth and what is wrong. It corrects and teaches us. So what, what better gift could I give you than to get up and just preach God's word to you. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. The the scriptures go on to speak of themselves. It says your word gives hope, your commands are right, your instructions are true, your laws are a treasure. They are wonderful, perfect, trustworthy, and last forever. The very essence of your words is truth. All of your regulations are just and will stand forever. And that is exactly why Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through, 12, 1 through 2, to patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage God's people by preaching God's word, not his own. Not his own. And by the grace of God, I will do that through the years. I've endeavored to do that, and I will, whether anyone likes it or not. That's what I will do. That's my commitment to him. Now here's the last thing in, uh, in Corinth anyway. And here's a drift, and that was um, way too much focus 
on the, the spiritual gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit. See, all, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, I believe it is, that all believers, all believers receive a spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit of God upon conversion. And that this spiritual gift is given to us not for our own thing, not for our own pride and look at me, but it's to build the body of Christ. You know, people talk about that, that they need to see the spiritual gifts being exercised in the church all the time because that's the, the Holy Spirit at work. Well, let me just tell you something. You know what the Holy Spirit's work is? His work is to give you the gift. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He decides what gift you get, and he distributes it as he sees fit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But it's your job to decide whether you're going to use it for him. That's, it's a matter of your will. He, do you know if you said yes to Jesus, you have a spiritual gift right now. Some type of gifting and talent to build up the church that you're in. For his glory. He gave it to you. And now he's standing there going like this. Right? You going to use it? He, he's done his work. I gave you a gift. What are you going to do with it? Use it. So that's what the work of the Holy Spirit is. He gives, we exercise the gift. But let me just say this. The problem in Corinth and the problem in a lot of churches now is that when the, there's a disagreement about the spiritual gift, when it causes division and strife within that particular body, that is not the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit, let me tell you what the main job of the work of the Holy Spirit is, is to point people to Jesus and to draw the family together by giving us gifts to make us stronger. And so anything that, that, that the gifts do to cause division and strife, that is not the work of of the Holy Spirit of God. You can't say that it is and slap his name on it and go, yep, that's it. No. He does not cause division. Jesus said, let there be no division in my church. Not one. Here is the last drift we'll cover and this series comes to an end and it's what we talked about last week. Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, Jesus talking to the church in Ephesus certainly could be talking to any church but he said, I know all the things that you do. I know everything that you do. And he said to the church in Ephesus, you have, you have been patient and you have suffered, but you've, been, you've, you've stuck it out. You've hung in there with me. You've, you've remained strong. You kept coming after me. And he was happy with that. But I do have this one complaint. You've lost your first love. You've fallen from your first of all love, protos. Not the first love chronologically, but the most important love. The only love that encompasses mind, heart, soul, and strength. All of who you are dedicated to the Lord. My mind is set upon loving Him and thinking about Him and meditating on who He is. My heart is set on Him. It beats for the gospel. My feelings, my emotions, my choices come from there. My soul loves Him. My soul is the only thing that lasts forever. My love for you, I'm pursuing a lifelong committed love to you. And my strength, my resources, my time, my, everything that I am, I'm expending. I'm going to bed tired at night because I've, I've worked hard to advance your kingdom. That's what I'm doing. If you love me, you keep my commands. If you love me, you share me with other people. And loving God so much that partnering on his mission to spread the gospel must become the number one priority in life. And this mission that he's put us on as a church transcends blood, it transcends vocation, it transcends affiliations, it transcends location, and it transcends vacation. And we are called to advance the kingdom of God. And when this is the single highest priority in an individual's life, he is part of a church that has lots and lots of logs on their fire. And that church will become a church on fire for him. When the individual parts are pursuing him with their whole heart, 
And that's a church that's healthy. And that's a church that will be growing. And that's a church that's full of love. And that's a church that would rock a world. And that's the church I believe he's called this church to be. And so I want to become united with him. I want to become one with him. And I want to become one with you in a new and more intimate and deeper way. I want us to be united in thought and purpose. United in identity. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. We are one with Jesus Christ and he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen? Amen. Now God has gifted us with a, a special gift called communion. And it's a time where we actually do just that. We commune with him. We become one single unit with him. I'm gonna call gentlemen to come up please. And they're going to pass out the communion elements to you. And I want you to hold on to them. And I'm going to come back up in just a moment. I'm going to take communion together as one family. 